Well, good morning. Uh, it is 10 o'clock and uh, I want to introduce myself and welcome you to this uh, webinar. I am Jim Repkowski, the Assistant Secretary of Labor. And on behalf of the Maryland Regional Direct Services Collaborative, welcome to this virtual seminar entitled Supporting the Frontline Direct Service Workforce, Return on Investment. This is the third of several series showcasing new workforce initiatives and the critically important role of the frontline direct care service worker. As with past sessions, we hope this session will be interactive and we will invite questions and comments both in the chat box as well as at the end of the three presentations of our distinguished speakers. I do wanna let you know that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Workforce, workforce, workforce. We hear it all the time and particularly now on the news. We hear that uh, how businesses are struggling to hire workers as they need to emerge from this pandemic economy to a post-pandemic recovery economy. And it's more complicated than ever. Enhanced federal unemployment benefits uh, filled much of the needed gap during the height of the pandemic, but businesses and industry organizations are struggling to hire the workers they need. Uh, and they're pointing to enhanced uh, in unemployment insurance benefits as a factor in that lack of ability to hire. And we know that it's not just about a warm body. It's about a person with the right skills and the right work ethic to do the job at hand and make it a career path that enhances their earning potential as a participant in Maryland's workforce. As I mentioned, I'm with the Maryland Department of Labor and I oversee the Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning. We are one of the several state level partners in Maryland's workforce system along with other state agencies and local workforce development agencies and local workforce boards. We offer job seekers training, education and access to employment opportunities to help workers prepare for and find meaningful employment on career pathways. And we partner closely with business and industry associations to ensure our workforce development efforts are strategically preparing workers with in-demand skills that employers need that will help keep Maryland's businesses thriving. Uh, what landed me here today is one of the programs that Maryland Labor administers, the Employment Advancement Right Now, or otherwise known as Earn Maryland. The Earn Maryland program awards funds to, strategically, to strategic industry partnerships comprised of employers, nonprofit organizations, higher education, local workforce development boards, and local governments. Since 2014, EARN has invested nearly $5 million in direct care occupations through five strategic partnerships around the state. Nearly 1,000 unemployed or underemployed individuals have been placed in direct care employment opportunities with the support of EARN funding. Another 408 incumbent workers received additional training, attained new credentials or certifications to enhance their skills to allow them to advance uh, in the direct care industry on a career pathway. But so what? It is more than just filling a job or an open position. For direct care positions, it's about people serving people. And when we say that direct, we are talking hands-on, up close and personal. What does it mean for our economy, the quality of our health care, the, the employment generated and the financial stability of families to keep our economy moving forward? Our panelists are here today to talk about return on investment, otherwise known as ROI, and what investment in training and direct care workforce means to our economy, the healthcare industry, the job seeker, and how we portray that to policymakers that have decision-making authority about <clears throat> making investments uh, in the direct care workforce. Um, I'd like to introduce and begin with our panel members. Uh, our first panel member is uh, Dr. Robin Stone. Uh, she is a founding board member of the Maryland Direct uh, Services Collaborative. Uh, she is currently the executive director and vice president for research at Leading Age Center for Applied Research. And her, her topic uh, is entitled Investing in Direct Services Workforce, Presenting the Evidence. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Stone. Thank you very much. Um, I am so help, happy to be here today uh, talking about an issue that is very close to my heart uh, and to the work that my organization does. I, uh, I am the SVP, Senior Vice President for Research at Leading Age, 
And uh, for those of you who do not know, we are uh, a national association of nonprofit aging services providers. We represent the full continuum of uh, aging services from nursing home to assisted living to home and community-based services to full campus uh, entities as well as affordable senior housing. So we have uh, quite an array of settings within our membership. And um, the issue that is facing all of our members today more than it has ever faced them before is workforce. There's not a day that goes by that uh, we don't get emails and calls about, please help us with solutions. Um, I, I'm here to say that I don't think there is a magic bullet to this workforce crisis. Uh, it has gotten worse uh, because of COVID. It has certainly exacerbated an ongoing challenge that we have had in the long-term services and support sector. Uh, my group in particular has been working on these issues for the entire 22 years that I have been at Leading Age. Uh, our first projects were around workforce development. We have had small grants. We have had multi-million dollar grants uh, looking at these issues and hope springs eternal that this time around, we are actually going to be able to think about some short-term and long-term uh, investments and solutions to the challenges that everybody faces. Anybody who is aging in this country uh, is going to face the same issues at some point in time. Um, I want to talk a little bit today, and then you're going to hear a little bit more in detail from the other presenters, um, why workforce investment is so important in this sector. Um, Assistant Secretary talked about the fact that these are the frontline hands-on jobs. In our sector, these individuals Certified nursing assistants, home care aides, personal care assistants, uh, direct support workers, all of these individuals provide between 60 and 80% of all the hands-on care in this, in this country. So if we think about our formal long-term services and support system, we must first recognize how important this direct service worker is probably more important to us than to the hospital or other parts of the healthcare sector because we are so dominated by this front line, which is why we need to think about workforce investment. Um, I cannot talk about workforce investment without talking about pay and benefits. So I wanted to start just by saying that this is almost a, um, almost a truism at this point, that pay and benefits are essential and I'm sure that you are seeing, uh, as many of us are, the challenges around inadequate uh, reimbursement and in inadequate payment uh, around this frontline workforce. It is something that we absolutely have to get a handle on. But the focus of this presentation today is not specifically on pay and benefits. It is on some of the other pieces of investment that, are, that I would argue are just as essential as pay and benefits. And in fact, my group has done quite a bit of both quantitative and qualitative work looking at the effects of training and the effects of career pathways and the direct relationship that they have to uh, monetary uh, outcomes as well as quality outcomes. So when I talk about training, I'm talking about at least three types of training. First is just the basic training for folks who come into our sector. And that includes competency-based training so that people actually can demonstrate the skills and the knowledge that they require to do this work. Also orientation training, which is essential on the job to actually get individuals to understand what the workplace is going to be for them. And one of the things that we often skimp on is that orientation training. We might do a few hours, but let me tell you that the data shows that it is at least a week or two of orientation training with a peer mentor that may be with a frontline worker coming in for as much as a year. That makes the difference, first in terms of mitigating turnover, which is rampant in our sector, but also in terms of the long-term investment 
in terms of not only keeping people on the job, but also having them have better skill sets and knowledge to produce quality outcomes. And finally, I want to highlight the fact that training never stops. <laughs> so it isn't like you train a certified nursing assistant, they get their 75 or 120 hours, and that's it. It is an ongoing process. We require certain types of level, hours of in-service training. But what I want to leave you with a message with today that your best return on investment is actually thinking about in-service that is really tied to the specific needs of a particular worker or a group of workers. That we have to think beyond the traditional, very much pedagogic, boring online videos that we put people in front of and think about in-service as teachable moments where we actually can help people learn and build skills where they have their gaps. That is the purpose of in-service. And I think we need to do a much better job of focusing on that piece of the training portfolio as well. The third thing that I would like to say is that it's not just the training, but as we think about training programs, we must think about how these trainings get implemented on the job. My staff and I have been in hundreds of nursing homes, assisted living providers, and home care agencies for myself, almost 40 years of work in this sector. And I can tell you that where things fall down is not necessarily that folks have not gone through a training program, but that the organizations themselves are not then positioned to actually help their staff implement. So that oftentimes within six months, the staff forgot that they even went to a training. We have to have partnerships between training entities and the employers themselves to ensure that there is a handoff and ongoing support for the staff when they come back to the organization to actually implement what they have learned. It really is, we must create a learning organization that thinks about training, not just as the beginning, but as an ongoing journey where the implementation piece is just as important as the initial training. And then finally, I wanna talk about the fourth area that we really need to be thinking about investment in, and that is career pathways. And there are two areas in which we can be very, very um, effective in terms of our return on investment. Not every aide wants to become a nurse. In fact, many of them do not. Many aides love their profession. And one of the things at Leading Age that we talk about is how to professionalize this workforce. So we need to be paying attention to what we call career lattices, which are basically within the profession of aid. What can we develop? How can we help folks to grow? There are specialties in dementia care, in medication management, in behavioral health, in oral health. There's some really good new programs that are developed around oral health technicians. So we need to be thinking very, very broadly about the career lattice opportunities, which by the way, are not free. Those also require investments in terms of monetary remuneration. But the payoff is that you have a much higher skilled staff, you have a much better prepared staff, you probably need fewer staff, which actually affects your worker shortage challenges. So that investment in career lattice is extremely important. And then of course, we also have career pathways. And if I leave you with one message only, it is please, 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 let's not think that everybody needs to become a nurse. Probably one of the skill sets that these, many of these aides have that many do not is the fact that they can build relationships with residents and clients. So we need to think about relationship oriented occupations, social work, the therapies, uh, management positions, particularly in human relations, and, um, and be much more creative in terms of the apprenticeship programs and the other development programs that we have around career pathways. Very quickly, if we can just move to the next slide. And I just wanna go through this really quickly. Why is this a return on investment? First of all, you're creating attractive competitive jobs to grow your pipeline. If you do not have good training programs,
that attract people into the sector and then have these pathways for folks to develop, we will never grow our pipeline. So training and career pathways is a, is a, the investment, one of the investments for helping us to develop a pipeline. Secondly, we know, and we have empirical evidence of this, that both good training and more importantly, career pathways, that, that potential for career advancement significantly reduces both the short turnover and the churning that occurs in those first three months. And that's when it's really critical because we tend to uh, lose a lot of staff during those first three months. And then the effects on the reduction of overall turnover, that's between four to $5,000 for a frontline aid. It's about 10,000 to $15,000 for a nurse. And we know empirically that lower turnover is associated with better quality of care and better quality of life outcomes. So this is where you really see your return on investment. It's in reductions of turnover, but also in those quality outcomes that you need, number one, to demonstrate to CMS, that you need to demonstrate to the consumer, and that you need to differentiate yourself in the, in the marketplace. And finally, just the third slide. So this return on workforce investment helps to create and expand the professional caregiving jobs, which we call professions. These are not low wage jobs. These are professional staff who are paid low wages. We have to shift the paradigm in terms of our nomenclature of what we're, what we're talking about. This is a profession. These professions contribute to a stronger local economy. And the more you grow your staff, the more they have money in their pockets to put back into the economy. And in a paper that we did on making care work pay, we demonstrated the effects of that on what workers who have money in their pockets can do in the local economy. These programs also support at-risk youth to bring them out of poverty and give them opportunities for job mobility. And finally, we have the opportunity to support displaced workers and also older workers who may need new job opportunities. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, the Assistant Secretary and move on to our next panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone. You had me at Career Pathway to use one of my favorite uh, lines from Dirty Dancing. Uh, that is, is so so critical. And you know, at Maryland's Department of Labor, uh, you know, when I got here in 2015, we used to talk about the way the system operated was, you know, all we cared about is if you got a job, you kept a job, and how much do you make? And that really doesn't address what an individual, a job seeker needs. And that is so simplistic that it really doesn't in the long run address what the business needs to in order to do what they need to do to be uh, successful. And uh, we've really adopted at Maryland Department of Labor what we call the benchmarks of success so that we look at the whole individual and all their different needs. But really what you talked about on that career pathway was uh, an individual's ability to increase their earning capacity. Yep. And, uh, you know, that is so critical. And again, uh, three of the goals of our benchmarks of success are, you know, maximizing that access to employment, maximizing access to skills and credentialing, maximizing access to life management skills, and of course, the supports that they need to be successful uh, at work and, and an overall workforce system that works better. But really appreciate those comments. And I'm going to turn to our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Memo Derricker. Uh, Dr. Dun Dr. Derricker is the founder and director of Beacon, which stands for Business, Economic, and Community Outreach Network. Uh, Beacon is at, the, at Salisbury University. Uh, Beacon provides evaluation and research services. And in fact, they actually provide those services to the Maryland Department of Labor uh, and the Earn Maryland program that I referenced earlier. Uh, Memo serves on the Board of Leadership Maryland and is a past chair of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And I turn the podium over to Dr. Derricker. Thank you very much. Um, in the past 25 years uh, at Beacon, we have been evaluating uh, workforce development programs from uh, a number of states, including, of course, the state of Maryland. Uh, as evidenced by our work with Earn Maryland for the past seven years. And all of the evaluation work we do 
revolves around something called the 3E methodology. Uh, in this part of the panel discussion, I'm gonna talk about how we do ROI estimations and answering the question, so what? What do we learn from doing ROI? How do we use it? Uh, with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me one second. So Earn Maryland program was created a little over seven years ago, and we've been involved in the process from the very beginning. And in evaluating the EARN um, program's efficiency and effectiveness, we use a methodology we developed a little over 25 years ago for the Somerset County workforce development folks called the 3E approach. Uh, the 3E approach asks three questions of any uh, workforce development program and indeed any kind of program or project that you want to evaluate. It asks these three questions. One, is it effective? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing in the best possible way? Two, is it efficient? Is it use, using the available resources in the most impactful way? And three, where's the evidence of the first two? So to do that, we've created a series of economic models, including an ROI estimation model, and we've developed dashboards to provide that evidence, uh, graphical present representation of that evidence. And as I said, we've been doing it for the past seven years for the EARN program. And during that program, we've evaluated well over 100 uh, workforce development initiatives around the state of Maryland. And we've actually taken what we have done to a number of national conferences to present and to, not, to a number of other states to help them develop theirs. The RI calculations use two sets of inputs. One, what is the Department of Labor investing in each one of these grants? And then how are these grantees leveraging additional resources to be able to deal with the problem at hand, whatever workforce development issue they're trying to resolve? And the outputs we track are the net present value of the earnings differential. You look at the trainee cohort, what have they been making in terms of earning? Do they have jobs, not have not jobs? And what does the training or the workforce development initiative give them that is going to increase their or change their earning over the lifetime of their uh, career? We use a um, 25 year career uh, timeline. We do this because we find out that that is the average time of work beyond training. Some of them come early in their career, some of them a little bit later. Uh, most other programs use 30 years, we use 25 years. We use a 3% growth rate and a 2% inflation rate. Although now post pandemic, we might have to rethink that 2% inflation rate. It might be a little bit higher. Uh, we also look at the direct, indirect and induced impact in the state of Maryland of this net present value. Um, the assistant secretary mentioned the importance of this impact for not only the individual, but also for the economy. This is one of the things we uh, estimate in this process. We also look at the net reduction in public transfer payments for those who participate in these programs, because if somebody is not employed or employable, if they're not gainfully employed, their reliance on public assistance program increases. So we look at these transfer payments and, and show the reduction of the need for such payments as a benefit. Uh, this also includes reduced incarceration, improved healthcare outcomes, and we have ways to quantify those kinds of positive uh, outcomes. We also look at the economic impact of those public transfer cost reductions. Anytime we're not using those resources for those public fund transfers, we can use them for other things. You know, for example, Maryland is also investing in apprenticeships. So if we can take a dollar we don't need in one pot and put it to a dollar that is going to improve employment, improve, improve economic activity, that's a good thing. The model we have created also looked at the economy-wide impacts of these leverage resources and the direct, indirect, and induced impact of the Maryland expenditures. For example, these grantees not only train people, but they have staff they pay for. They have uh, vendors that sell them goods and services. So we look at the impacts of those as well. We look at the direct, indirect, and induced impacts of the training to the Maryland employer. Several of our earned grantees are doing training programs that are determined by strategic industry partnerships. 
One of the reasons this program is so successful, much more successful than its peers in the nation, is that it is almost entirely employer driven. The employer strategic industry group determines what the training needs to be. What that means is that they can bring training people, they can bring train staff on board, or they can train incumbent workers to become better trained, and they then go on to uh, expand their operations, increase their sales, etc. That is a positive economic impact for the state. And finally, we looked at look at the impacts of the net present value of those transfer payment savings over the same 25 year horizon we mentioned. So a couple of notes that uh, even with the COVID pandemic, the EARN pro program maintains its efficiency effectiveness. In fact, uh, the current return on investment is $17.32 in lifetime value for each dollar invested. That is approximately three times better than the peers nationally. Again, the reason is, there are many reasons for it, but the number one reason is that it's employer driven. The training is determined by the employer who has the jobs to offer now, which is why the name of the program is has the word now in it. And even with COVID, if we hadn't had, if we didn't have the impact of COVID, if the economy had continued the way it was before COVID, that impact would have been $18.47 for each dollar invested. That's an important distinction because we know that there has been a disruption and that disruption is manifesting itself in a lot of programs. But to take a program like this and suffer only about a dollar's worth of reduction in, in return on investment, that shows how robust this program is. Now comes the important question. So what? Why, why do we do this? Okay. Well, first of all, we want to show the decision makers, elected and appointed decision makers at the top levels that these resources are not expenses, that they are investments with high returns. It is very important because if a decision maker comes to the table thinking, I need to reduce expenses rather than I need to improve returns, the outcome is going to be different. So we're trying to do a paradigm shift in the way decision makers make their decisions with regards to these kinds of workforce development investments. As I mentioned, we use a 25 year timeline. This also changed in the mindsets that this is not a one and done kind of thing. This has a residual impact well over 25 years to the benefit of the economy. It is very important that these programs be designed the right way and the ROI calculations show us the stronger points of the design of the program and the weaker points that need to be improved upon, which is the next bullet uh, with the EARN program as well as with all of our other evaluation programs. Each cycle of evaluation creates a set of recommendations to improve the way the program is done. So the ROI is a continual improvement tool that enables us to make positive decisions that is going to further improve the impact, the beneficial impact of the program. As I mentioned, leverage resources are very, very critical. We need to understand that just putting money into training is not the beginning or the end of this. It is part of a continuum. And in the case of EARN, and with all direct service uh, training programs within the EARN program, we realize that case management is very important. If an individual cannot make it to the training programs because of transportation issues, childcare issues, dependent care issues, healthcare issues, then all that money we've invested in is, is going to get wasted. We need to leverage other resources to be able to wrap around the trainee to get them to the right end point the way it, the program has intended to. Creating, maintaining, and improving a best practices and a knowledge base is very important because as new grantees or new individuals employed in the grant management program come on board, they're gonna rely on these best practice and knowledge based uh, contents to be able to maintain and improve the program. And that the vast majority of what's in these best practices databases and the knowledge bases come from these ROI and other evaluation activities. I want to emphasize once again that ROI calculations are first and foremost a management tool that help us manage these kinds of things, but they are also 
used very effectively as proof of value to maintain funding and in some cases, especially in the case of EARN, to be able to actually increase the funding available even when other programs were being cut. So I, I share these with you, not only as Beacon Director, but I deal with direct service employees all the time. I'm the board chair of a regional medical center and we are constantly in the process of looking for and training direct service employees. Our medical system also owns or partners with uh, two nursing homes, home health care agency, and other direct service employment opportunities that we are always looking for ways to improve the workforce development programs either we support or we, we offer our, ourselves. And in all of these, that dashboard that shows us the return on investment, that dashboard shows us the efficiency and effectiveness is the number one tool we use in making those decisions. And in some cases, these are multi-million dollar decisions to be able to get to a better outcome. So it is not just an academic exercise. It is a very practical, very useful exercise. And with 25 years of doing this, uh, we're very happy that we can be of service to the Maryland Department of Labor, as well as a lot of other organizations that look at this ROI concept. And I have a feeling that in the future, this ROI concept is going to become even more sophisticated and more welcome. Uh, and in some cases, even a requirement of a lot of funding decisions. I thank you very much. And if you have any questions at the end of the presentation, the other presentation, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Derricker. Appreciate those comments. And for those movie buffs out there that were eager to correct me, I made the wrong movie reference. I was quoting Jerry Maguire, who's who Jerry Maguire, where he said, you had me at hello uh, in that movie. So you had me at career pathways. Dirty Dancing, my favorite quote there is, nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> uh, so it, this is going to be, nobody puts direct care service providers in the corner. It's going to be my Dirty Dancing uh, reference and theme for, for today. So I'd like to move on. Uh, I, Dr. Derricker, we do appreciate your services. And that third-party evaluation is so critical anytime that you were using uh, either foundation, privately donated money. Uh, you know, any investor, including government, wants to see what they're getting for that investment. And uh, we use that return on investment data and research that we get from Beacon uh, in our General Assembly testify, in our General Assembly testimony every year we go before the legislature and we go before the budget committee. Governor Hogan, when he came into office, EARN was funded at about $4 million. In the second year of office, uh, he doubled that and is funded at $8 million now. And it's continued to be funded at that level. Uh, and we have been able to keep that level funding and increased funding because of that solid return on investment. And even the U.S. Department of Labor, many, as, as Memo mentioned, uh, many of their uh, uh, discretionary grants are requiring third party evaluation. They want to go back to Congress and say, look, we invested this amount of money for this program in Maryland. This is how they spent it. This was the return on investment. Congress, please continue to, to fund these very worthy programs. So, and that, and it being a third party, I can say it till I'm blue in the face. Uh, one of my grantees can say it till they're blue in the face, uh, but it's that third party evaluator uh, that really assists us in demonstrating and making that argument. I'd like to move on to our, our final presenter, uh, Mr. Joe DeMatos. Uh, he is the president of the Health, of Health Facilities of Maryland, which is the oldest and largest long-term care association of employers in Maryland. Prior to joining uh, the Healthcare Facilities Association of Maryland, he served as the our senior state director in Maryland. Uh, so here we're going to get kind of that employer perspective. We've, we've gotten various perspectives, but it's so important. Uh, this association represents the facilities out that are craving for this workforce and are of course held accountable for the care that they give and the maze of things that they have to report to in Medicaid, Medicare, and all the complicated stuff. Uh, he's gonna talk about assessing the return on supporting the frontline workforce how business benefits. Mr. Tomatos. Jim, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. You know, and you also hit two of my favorite movie quotes. Um, you know, uh, you had me at hello, nobody puts baby in a corner. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna add uh, when the game's on the line, uh, the champions and winners want the ball for the movie replacements filmed right here in Baltimore. But, um, <laughs> Listen, it's it's so, so great to be amongst friends and colleagues, especially 
memo from Leadership Maryland and represent the great class of 08 in my case. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jim, you had me at, at EARN, you really did. And like you, Robin had me at Career Pathways and, and Memo had me at Investment and ROI. Um, so I'd like to just do a little bit of level setting and offer some data. Um, I'm gonna thank Christina for handling my slides here in a minute. We'll keep it on this <clears throat> for a minute and thank Ron Carlson and all he does with the collaborative for getting us together. So, you know, in 2019, we lost the CEO of Kaiser uh, Healthcare Systems too early, Bernard Tyson. And Bernard had a very famous quote about healthcare. He said, you know, the problem with healthcare is so little that happens in the doctor's office. And this is, this is to Memo's point with regard to uh, cost transfer payments and savings. So much of healthcare uh, is about food deserts and education and family well-being and local threat assessments. And so more much of workforce retention and recruitment is about those same things, where you live, what is the availability of public transportation? What is the availability of childcare? And, and I just think it's really important to level set that now and to point out a weakness that we have from the top down in healthcare, from Congress to state and local governments, is that in healthcare specifically, we don't look at the funding of it in the dynamic way that Memo suggests. We, we don't recognize the investments we make in childcare, education, food deserts, transportations traditionally we don't use those types of dynamic scoring mechanisms, whether it's the Congress or state legislature or a state or a county government, to understand that if we increase public transportation in the right way, and if we um, make sure that we're absent food deserts in places, and we make sure that there are recreational activities in a community, that they have a direct uh, impact on both the wellness of the community and the availability of the workforce. And so to Robin's point, you know, wages and benefits are super, super important. Um, we all need to double our efforts on that. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to re recognize that it's not just about wages and benefits. It's about safety, community, childcare, education, all of those things. So Christina, next slide. Um, you know, uh, we are, whether you are a, a hospital, a doctor's office, a nursing home, uh, you know, an assisted living campus, healthcare is a people helping people enterprise. There's room for um, growth and use of technology in our space, but in the end, it's always going to be about people taking care of people. And I just want to pause here and just have folks soak in these pictures of our healthcare heroes in our setting and realize that they are changing lives of Marylanders in need every single day. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, pre COVID pandemic, um, workforce recruitment and retention in healthcare was a challenge from physicians to nurses' aides. And specifically with nurses, the health, the, the, the recruitment retention challenge in healthcare specific to nurses was unique pre-pandemic and is unique now in that it's not a demographic or a job shortage. It's an educational shortage related to the shortage of nurse educators. So the shortage that we're facing specific to nurses, not just in Maryland, but in the country, is not one of the cyclical um, shortages that we've experienced uh, in the past. It's specific to the fact that we don't have enough nurse educators to have enough slots in nursing schools to meet the need. And the same is true with physicians. Um, and so pre-pandemic, we had a, a, a shortage in these areas. The pandemic signed a bright light on it. And it's gonna take all of us to, to really solve this challenge going forward. Look, I, 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 in the comments I'm offering today, I'm informed by my 12 years of experience at HFAM. 
I'm also informed in my experience as the AARP state director in Maryland and the 10 years I spent um, in AARP leadership nationally uh, and in other states. And finally, I'm informed in my, by my consumer experience in the decade that I spent in state government. I, I'm proud that HFAM has been around for 72 years um, and that we're the largest representative of nursing homes and, and assisted, living, uh, assisted livings in Maryland. We're not the largest representative of assisted livings, but the reality is is that um, what I'm sharing today, I share from that broader perspective um, and in partnership with Robin and my colleague associations at Leading Age National, my colleagues at ARP nationally, my colleagues here in Maryland, Kevin Hefner at Lifespan Network and Allison Sabarowski at Leading Age Maryland. We all have our sweet spots and we all have our strengths and it's gonna take every one of us to get workforce recruitment and retention right going forward. Um, look, you, you, you have here some numbers you can read and you've probably read them faster than I can read them. Um, but the thing I want you to remember is that we are a large, impactful, strong workforce in Maryland. And if you remember nothing else from these 10 minutes, remember those four, four bullet points at the bottom of this slide. Um, we have an obligation, all of us, to promote jobs in our sector, in nursing homes, assisted living, home health, hospitals, doctor's office, as desired positions, honored, cherished positions, not jobs of last resorts. You know, uh, we, we need to change the story around that together. And, you know, we are unique in, in our sector in that on the one hand, 80% of the revenue coming in is non-negotiable in the form of Medicare and Medicaid rates, but our staffing levels and our regulatory environment are regulated. So unlike Starbucks or Lowe's or any of the other businesses we're familiar with, what people pay us for care is largely non-negotiable, but how we spend the money in terms of staffing ratios, as an example, is, 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 is mandated, right? And that's a challenge. So it's gonna take all of us to continue to advocate for adequate federal and state funding. Um, Robin had me at revitalizing career pathways and, and I'm drawing here upon my AARP experience. You know, in the early 2000s at AARP as a national non-for-profit enterprise, we began identifying best employers. And some of the employers that we identified in the early 2000s at AARP were utility companies because they were very intentional in realizing that Memo, as a 23 or 24 year old, has a predetermined life expectancy of how long he can climb up and down telephone poles. And they know that. They know how long Memo is likely to climb up and down telephone poles. So when Memo is doing that in his 20s, they're assessing him, they're finding out what his passions are. And they're saying, well, what would be the next job for Memo so he doesn't leave us after he's done going up and down utility poles? And then maybe they give him a headquarters job or a regional job. And maybe they decide, wait, this person has a passion for accounting or this person has a passion for training or they have the potential to get a master's degree. And, 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 and those were the type of organizations that we at AARP identified as best employers in the early 2000s. Together, all of us need to do that in precisely the way Robin suggests in healthcare. You know, I have many, many anecdotal stories of nurses' aides who became nurses, who became lawyers, some who became social workers. The challenge is it's all anecdotal and it's somewhat unintentional. And we have to bring intention to that. Finally, we have government barriers to this. You know, Maryland is rightfully or wrongfully, it's just a fact, we're the only state in the country that still has state certified geriatric nursing assistants. So in Maryland, all of the people that go through the nurses training program, nurses aides program, if they work in a doctor's office or in a hospital, they're not required to sit for the state exam. They can go to work just based on the training. If they work in our sector, they have to sit for the state exam, right? 
So what often happens is people maybe will start out and saying, I want to work in our sector, but they end up working in another sector where the exam isn't required. And again, to the point that Robin makes, training is, 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 is career-wide. It's, it's, it's from start, middle, finish. We do it all. Next, next slide, please, uh, Christina. Um, so I just, th I said this before, but I just want to say it again, because it leads into a couple of other quick points about the pandemic. Um, the vast majority of people that enter nursing homes specifically come to a nursing home from a hospital after an acute episode, right? They, they don't arrive like the Mayberry commercial from the 70s or 60s, driving up with, you know, with their family members and their suitcase and having high tea and bridge at the nursing home, right? They're arriving via ambulance, largely to get stronger before they go home after an acute hospital stay. And they stay about a month and they, they do that. And as I said, about 80% of the rates are non-negotiable um, in terms of revenue coming in. Um, because of demographic changes, um, prior to the pandemic, we were below the 90% occupancy in skilled nursing and rehab centers in Maryland before the pandemic. Basically, we haven't really gotten to the boomers yet, right? So for the first time in a long time, we went below 90%. The average is about 88% accuracy. Next slide, please. Um, all, all healthcare in, in the country, in our sector, is local. Uh, census in the 15,000 skilled nursing and rehab centers in the country um, is down to about a 70% average now, post-pandemic, 70%, right? So that's huge because we're still a sector that's paid largely fee for service, you know, butts in beds by Medicare and Medicaid, and Medicare is the better payer. So these numbers here are specific numbers from the Maryland Department of Health from 2020 relative to care in nursing homes in Maryland. And you'll see that because fewer people were going into the hospital during the pandemic, for elective procedures, um, fewer people went into nursing homes, about a million people less into Maryland nursing homes. And you'll see there occupancy from April to December last year um, in, in Maryland. And you see the steep decline in, in census, which is a steep decline in revenue. So while we are fighting the worst pandemic in a hundred years, revenue is down. Now, thank God for the federal assistance on that, but revenue is down. Next slide, please. Interestingly, I'll leave you with this statistic that isn't here. Care per hours of care per patient was actually up during the pandemic. Hours per care per patient in Maryland in a nursing home were actually up. But look at look at look at the hours by job category. Um, we had 650,000 fewer CNA hours, but almost 100,000 more contracted CNA hours at a higher cost and maybe at a higher expense relative to an organizational culture. You, you just needed bodies there to help do the work, right? To Robin's point, um, you want to rely less on contract labor, right? And we just needed people to provide care during the pandemic, right? So those are interesting stats. Um, we also had fewer RNs, but more contracted RNs. And we had fewer LPNs than we had contracted LPNs. So that trend continued. Now, when we were in, this stat is in here because I didn't wanna like stat everybody out. But when we were in the heart of the pandemic, we had many, many more RN hours to compensate for the lack of CNA hours. So in the heart of the pandemic last year, we had many, many hundreds of thousands more RN hours than we had traditionally CNA hours. Again, at much higher cost, both in terms of the educational and the job function, but also because they were contract employees. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I think this is the last slide, and it just uh, reiterates that some of the stats that we're facing right now, you know, there are 15,000 skilled nursing and rehab centers in the country. Um, 
uh, the last month's labor report indicated that there are about 20,000 fewer jobs in those settings right now. Um, we cite to the Washington Post Kaiser Foundation study here relative um, to burnout in our profession. We are just beginning the post COVID uh, pandemic career burnout across all sectors, which, which we have to factor in. So if, uh, Christ, uh, Christ, uh, Christina, if you can go back to my first slide real quick, uh, there's a slide at the end with all my contact information, um, but, but um, the one on the bottom here, these four bullet points that I gave you the cliff notes for at the start of my presentation, if you remember anything, let's all today rededicate ourselves to promoting our jobs as not jobs as last resorts, but cherished healthcare hero jobs. Let's advocate for continued funding. As Memo says, let's look at the dynamic scoring and investment. As Robin says, let's revitalize our career pathways um, and let's remove barriers to entry. So Jim, that's my quickie. <laughs> Mr. Demados, thank you so much for those remarks. And I do wanna take time to thank all of the panelists for their insightful remarks. Um, uh, and for taking time to address our attendees today, I want to thank Ron Carlson and the Collaborative for inviting each of the panelists and inviting me to moderate this discussion. Uh, you know, my takeaways, I really like the, the idea of that desired and rewarding career. Uh, it's really important. Uh, and it should be a selfish passion for all of us uh, in that uh, in times of, of human uh, frailty, uh, when someone is in need of help, this is where we're going to be. And these are the individual professionals that are going to be providing to us when we're probably in our most challenging physical state. Uh, so, you know, it is, it is really about it. And I really also like that there are so many careers uh, in a skilled nursing or rehabilitation facility uh, from doctor to, to, to uh, facilities, to dietary. Uh, it is an entry into an industry where there really is no limit uh, as to where you can go professionally. Again, back to that uh, career pathway, uh, an opportunity to continue to gain uh, additional um, uh, money. I guess I wanted to say a real practical word for it or a more professional word, but everybody likes to get paid money. And then when they're in the job, they like that advancement in salary. I wanna thank the, the panelists for uh, playing along with my movie theme, my impromptu movie theme. And I do wanna open it up now with the help of our facili other facilitator, uh, the Rodham Institute, uh, if there are questions, uh, we'd like to uh, give an opportunity to anyone participating. And then I will close with some closing announcements. Do we have uh, any, any questions. Jim, earlier on, uh, Ron had asked a question. And I answered it. Uh, I typed that answer, but I don't know if everybody saw it. The question was, why don't people do this if, if this is uh, so important? Ron, would you like to ask that question again? Yeah, the question, uh, if, if you can hear me. Um, we can hear you. Uh, very, very impressive. Thank you very much for all of what you do. Um, I'm still uh, uh, I'm concerned uh, when you look at all the data, Joe, and you, you've painted a very, very uh, wonderful uh, data-oriented picture. Why is there such a reluctance to invest in this part of the workforce? Uh, if we have persuasive arguments, and obviously we have some really good ones and they are getting stronger with more experience, why is there a reluctance on the, on the part of the business and even the state community uh, to do a, an increase in the investment in this part of the workforce? So I, I didn't answer Ron's question directly, but I did answer um, as it pertains to ROI. And, and one of the reasons I believe um, they don't invest because they don't see it as an investment, they see it as an expense. Uh, but if they were to see it as an investment, they would definitely like that return and have uh, more of a reason to invest in uh, workforce development. However, uh, there's also a question, a related question is why don't people do ROI, even those who are investing? And the answers to that are, are several. Some of them just don't know how to do it. Um, some of them don't have the resources to be able to do it. Others are not, do not feel that it is required of them to do it. 
And there are a few who just don't want to do it because it would show inefficiencies and um, lack of effectiveness. So all those together create a perfect storm that reduces the emphasis on ROI. And that reduced emphasis on ROI in turn reduces the um, reasons or the justification for investing in workforce development. Resources are, are constrained. So people are saying, hey, wherever can I, I can save money. I want, you know, I'll steal someone else's employee or I'll, I'll get somebody who's already trained for some, somewhere else. And we all know that doesn't work. Uh, we have a regional coalition here uh, on the Eastern shore uh, that Beacon has created, uh, gosh, almost 30 years ago called Grayshore Coalition. And it within the Grayshore Coalition's annual summit where we create a manifesto, one of the top things is that that lack of trained and trainable workforce to deal with an aging population. Um, so the return on investment is clear, but uh, as Joe's numbers showed, you know, the people who pay for that return are not necessarily the people who invest in that training. Yeah, I'll jump in. Hi, hi. Mem Mem Robin, you go first and then I'll go No, after. no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I pre that's kind of you, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> I think, so I think, first of all, you know, um, being very frank as we all have been, um, and telling a data story and tapping our passion. There's no lack of passion or data on this call, um, which is great. Um, look, uh, being really frank. Um, so there are people that do this really well in healthcare and people who do it poorly. Um, and and they're, they're all over the map. There are organizations that have turnover rates of less than 20%. And there are organizations that really sadly have turnover rates over an annualized basis of like 80%, which is ridiculously expensive and, un and unacceptable, right? Now, let's be really frank. In a pre-COVID world, with the normal cyclical um, happenings of the economy and the job market, um, you could, anywhere in healthcare, I'm not just talking specifically about nursing homes, just to be clear, but anywhere in healthcare, um, given the previous historical economic and workforce cycles, you could manage your way through that process um, and get by. Um, you can't in the post-COVID world, just straight up. You can't. It's just, it's too broken. The, 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 the spotlight is shining too brightly. And so those organizations that, have, that haven't been doing it well, and have a closer to let's say 80% turnover rate. Um, they're gonna they're gonna need to get into the recruitment and retention business as a line of business in order to succeed. And 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 that's that's just the reality. Um, and then the people that were doing it and that were lucky to be at 20% um, are gonna look at reducing the number. And you know, none of this, and Robin brought up one really good point. I mean, a bunch of points, but one that resonates with me right now that I'll just stop and share her point and let her jump in. You know, we often focus on healthcare that it's about government. Like in my case, 80% of the money is non-negotiable, but the way you spend it is mandated. That's a fact. But, but, an important but, consumer expectations are huge. And for those of you that didn't recognize Robin's comment that she, where she brought that up, consumers are going to demand that we do better at retention and, 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 uh, recruitment and retention. Robin, I throw it over to you. And we have less than two minutes uh, before the end of the session. Yeah. So and I have a couple closing comments. Yeah, maybe you should just wrap it up. I, I think my one point would be, this is a very undervalued sector in general. And this is a very, very undervalued workforce that is seen as a low wage, unskilled workforce. And until we change the notion that these folks are highly skilled, need competencies, and have this is not an entry level dead end job, but actually entry level into a very, very <laughs> diverse and exciting opportunity sector, we're going to have the same challenges over and over again. 
Um, Thank you, Dr. Stone. Uh, I would close with saying this webinar was recorded and will be on the Collaborative's website. I want to highlight the Collaborative's work uh, to Mr. Carlson's question on Senate Bill 307, Direct Care Workforce Innovation Program, which recently became law and takes effect on October 1st, 2021. And it creates a dedicated fund of $250,000 for direct care support workforce uh, training to be administered by the Maryland Department of Labor. Those funds will be available July 1st, 2022 in the fiscal 23 budget. Um, and they will be administered by our Earn Maryland uh, programs in a similar way by our special grants team. Uh, and we are adding it to our Earn Maryland portfolio where we will have dedicated funding uh, to support direct care support. We have several pots of money that we say, we call it Earn Proper, which is our general uh, fund. We have Earn Cyber, we have Clean Earn. Uh, now we have Direct Care Earn uh, in, in fiscal 23. So we're very excited. I wanna acknowledge uh, Mary Keller, uh, Earn. Uh, the Special Grants Administrator and Brittany Crisafulli, who are both attending this webinar to learn more about our challenges and in industries, as they're going to be the staff folks that administer that pot of money and have already administered the $5 million of earned grants that have gone towards direct care uh, support professionals. Uh, the next webinar is July 8th on the topic of steps needed to further the community's investment in frontline workforce. On behalf of the collaborative, the panelists, the Rodham Institute, thank you for attending today's webinar. Have a great day.